the following hour and 15 minutes is a session out of our Custodia lab and it tackles one of the most important questions that we are faced with as a species right now how does our body really work and for me it's that important and that's why I'm gonna release it here publicly on YouTube Custodia lab is our community of practice where we come together to deepen our embodiment of what we wish to see in the world and at the same time raise our capacity to serve the more beautiful world our hearts know is possible it's our digital hub for custodians we're gonna come together in regular online gatherings and I'm at the same time um, offering sessions like these to all sorts of topics that that are important that are related to our embodiment and at the same time to our service into the world yeah I'm talking a lot, a lot about entrepreneurship as well but today we will dive into the intri intricacies of this incredibly complex system that our bodies are if you feel a calling to join our custodia lab and to work on implementing all that which we are discussing today you can apply via the link in the show notes with that being said, I wish you a beautiful journey. May it turn your world upside down as much yeah, as it turned my world upside down when I dove into the topic that we're going to explore today. Enjoy. One of the most essential skills that we are invited to acquire as custodians is uh, systemic thinking and this is something quite contrary to <laughs> what most of the world is doing out there and what i did <laughs> over <laughs> the majority of my lifespan looking for shortcuts looking for the magic pill looking for co cookie cutter solutions Yeah, there was a certain problem and then there must be one solution for it. Let's go for that. But what this really simple linear thinking doesn't take into account is that we are living in a world that is incredibly complex and where everything we do has implications onto other components of the system. But we just don't look at it. Like the way we consume, the way we live, has implications on the other side of the planet because of the material that needs to be extracted from the earth in order to fuel our consumerist lifestyles. But it's very easy to not look at it. To just be in the here and now, to go on Amazon, to order whatever, whatever you need, to get it delivered to your door, to live in your nice house. It's still quite easy to ignore the effects of what we are doing on other components of the system. But the, <laughs> the ability to, to ignore slowly decreases the more we open ourselves up, the more we broaden our consciousness, the more we step into this identity of being a custodian. Because if we do that, we become aware of all the other effects that our actions are causing. And this is the moment when we step into the realm of systemic thinking, of seeing ourselves as one part of a very complex system and whatever we are doing and whatever we are not doing has implications for all the other components of the system. And this is true on a micro level within, for example, our family, within our communities, with the people we are surrounding ourselves with. And at the same time, this has implications on the macro level. As I said, the way we consume, the way we build our, build our houses, uh, what we eat, like everything has implications on basically the whole planet <laughs> because of our interconnected supply chains. And the more we become aware of that, in a certain sense, it gets easy. It gets harder to just do your thing, very linear, 
because you somehow finally realize what's going on and what are the consequences of your actions, not just in your individual life, but on a more broader sense. And at the same time, this opens up a, an opportunity to redesign, to rethink, and to step into a more aligned way of living, not just for us, but for the bigger whole, for all the other components of the system. And in order to do that, we are invited to practice this quite complex skill of systemic thinking every day with everything we are doing. And today I want to propose um, a very beautiful training ground for this invaluable skill. And this has to do with our physical bodies. Because our physical bodies are an incredibly complex system as well. Consisting of millions of different parts, components, little microorganisms, bones, tissues, like muscles. Like every time I connect myself with the incredible miracle that my physical body is, just that I'm able to walk, just that I'm able to breathe, just that I'm able to speak and see and taste and like the majority of this incredibly complex system is working unconsciously i don't need anything I, i don't need to do anything in order for my digestion to work or for my for an open wound to heal i don't need anything i don't need to do anything it's just working and for me lately it has become a deep passion to study this incredible sophisticated incredibly sophisticated apparatus and it strengthens my skill of thinking systemically because with with our bodies it's super easy to live in the old like linear really narrow-minded thinking um as well okay i have a certain sense of disease i go to the doctor i throw a pill everything is good again But for me personally, this is not possible anymore. <laughs> the more I open myself up to the to what is really going on, both on a macro as well as on a micro level, I cannot go for the shortcut anymore because I sense it's not working. It's causing a lot of harm left and right. And the only way forward is to study this complex system and to learn how it really works in order to be able to better serve it especially in moments when things are not working properly, as it is the case for me right now uh, with my foot that was swollen for quite a while and I cannot walk. I'm staying in bed since 11 days right now. And that's a moment for deep co contemplation and for deepening my own understanding of how does my body really work in order to better understand it and at the same time in order to practice my capability to, to think systemically, to have multiple components of the system in mind and observe how, how are they behaving and how are they interacting with each other and to really understand this dynamic that's, uh, that has gotten a, a, deep, a deep passion for me. Um, and that's something that happened really Recently, when I look back into my years in school, biology class wasn't something I was really looking forward to. It felt too far away from reality. We were studying some like ribosomes, some like small things inside a cell. And I was like, I don't know, what, what is it and what impact does it have on my everyday life? And like, it felt, it felt too far away. But what I'm doing right now with my studies of the five biological laws, and this will be the topic of today's session, I get a deeper understanding of how this incredibly sophisticated apparatus really works. And this not only strengthens my skill to think systemically, and at the same, at the same time it 
deepens my appreciation for this apparatus. And I get into deeper contact with the incredible miracle that life is. And it, like, it baffles me how almost nobody of us really understands this intricate system. How does my body work? What does it really do? There is so much dangerous half-knowledge out there. Um, when I shared with people what is going on with my foot, I received so many, of course, well-meaning recommendations that at the same time are quite misleading. They are not an appropriate response to what is really going on, but are a result of like things that people picked up here and there and then they tried it for themselves and then they realized, oh, okay, this didn't cause any harm. I've, it's okay, okay. And then I recommend it to other people as well. But like, as I said, studying my body with the five biological laws is an exercise of systemic thinking. It's not like, okay, do this, then X happens for each and every person. But it's more like, okay, what is taking place inside my body in this very moment? And taking the the cyclical nature into of our bodies into consideration and yeah the more i dive into this rabbit hole the more i realize it's way more complex and at the same time it's possible to grasp that it's possible to understand that it's possible to de really develop an understanding of my body and the deeper I dive into that, the more I am able to let go of these wrong conclusions that I that I um, yeah that I made in the past as well. For example, um, I transitioned my diet to eating vegan, um, high raw, um, almost no gluten, almost no refined sugar, like. 13, 14 years ago and ever since then I sense that when I'm eating gluten when I'm eating highly processed stuff my digestion um, is like all over the place that means the food that I'm eating is not good for me or I concluded that every time I'm in an airplane my nose gets gets blocked Like I, and I thought like okay, airplane, air it's not good for me, it's not fresh, so my nose is having a problem. Or I concluded that in the beginning of the, dy dy the current dynamics with my foot, I, I was like, oh, I was walking barefoot a lot and I had an open wound, probably something got in there and then it got infected. And now my foot is in the condition that it is in right now. Or I'm wearing glasses and in the past, I concluded that my eyes are not as powerful as they can be because I'm having so much screen time. And all these conclusions, as it turned out, are incorrect. <laughs> and I held them for many, many years of my life. And these are just the tip of the iceberg. There's so much more to uncover. And that I somehow... Um, yeah that I somehow um, put into my inner archive as truth, but that I'm slowly um, rethinking or getting a new perspective on through my studies of the five biological laws. All right, let me give you an introduction into this hugely fascinating topic that consumes a lot of my energy and focus these days um, and I'm like studying intensely and with with every every new realization I have my like just like awe and wonder about like this incredible physical body that we are gifted with increases and increases I would like to encourage you to take notes um, this uh, the system, as I said, it's complex. It's an exercise in systemic thinking. It's not like, okay, you have this, then do that. It's nuanced. And that's why it makes a lot of sense to to, to take notes in order to um, 
facilitate your your process of grasping what's going on here. Um, let's start with a little story about uh, Dr. Hammer. He's a um, a German um, a German doctor, passed away a couple of years ago. Um, he's the one who discovered these five biological laws, and then others like refined them and refined them into the body of knowledge that it is right now. And he lost his son in a very tragic accident. And of course, there was a, like, he was grieving. It was like, yeah, it was a really intense process. And then a little bit later, he realized that in his testicles, there was a buildup of tissue. And of course, his his colleagues immediately were like, "You have testicular cancer. We need to we need to intervene quickly." But somehow he sensed something else is going on. And at the time he was regular doctor practicing and like, yeah. And he sensed like something else is going on. And he started to connect the dots between the death of his son and his testicular cancer. And he found out that it's a natural re reaction for our bodies that when our only offspring dies, there's emergency mode. Oh my God, the survival of my species is in danger. I need to produce more offspring. And what does the body do in order to help? producing more offspring by increasing the function for men in our testicles in order to be more potent, in order to increase the chances to produce more offspring. And this increase in function um, brought along with it in, in um, this uh, uh, buildup of tissue. And... Like this was the first major question mark he put behind what we how we usually treat our bodies in the in the old medical like paradigm. And he realized something else is going on. Maybe my body is a lot wiser than I think. Maybe I don't need to intervene. Of course, back in the days, he didn't knew that. He treated his cancer like regularly. But after that, a change happened inside himself. And a change happened how he treated his patients. And he discovered that every symptom our body expresses is the result of a sensible biological special program that is fundamentally designed to enhance our chance, chances of survival and reproduction. Everything that my body expresses from a running nose to a swollen foot to uh, swollen testicles, like everything is designed to enhance our chances of survival and reproduction. There is no evil enemy in sight. There are no, according to the five biological laws, there are no viruses. There is no such thing as contagion, meaning you were in close contact with somebody who had a certain kind of disease and now you have it as well. According to the five biological laws, this is not existent. According to the five biological laws, there are no allergies. There are no chronic diseases, meaning you have this disease and it is un incurable and you will have it for the rest of your life. According to the five biological laws, there are no diseases at all. Nothing is wrong with our bodies. Everything is just the result of a certain biological program that is running inside my body as a reaction to a conflict. A conflict with my biological needs. In the story of Dr. Hammer and uh, the death of his son, his biolo one of his most fundamental biological needs is to pass on your genes and to contribute to the to the um, survival of your species and when your only offspring 
dies, of course, that's a major conflict with your biological needs. So your body reacts in a certain way in order to enhance your chances of fulfilling this biological need again. According to the five biological laws, there's no such thing as cancer. In general, like it, <laughs> there are no bucket diagnoses as we have in the current medical system. For example, a flu with a sore throat and a running nose and maybe a headache and like this is a bucket diagnosis. Like many symptoms gets put get get put under like one umbrella flu or COVID or Lyme disease or whatever. According to the five biological laws, every symptom is the result of a special biological program that is running that we can understand, that we can observe, and there's nothing wrong with it. Everything is designed to enhance our chances of survival and reproduction, to enhance our chances of fulfilling our primal biological needs. And this builds on the assumption that even though we develop these big brains and like crazy consciousness and artificial intelligence and like everything that is part of like this, everything that is part of our lives, deep down we are still these very primal beings. And everything that happens that goes against the fulfillment of our most primal needs, food, security, reproduction, results in a biological activation of a special program. So we are walking through our lives, everything is in perfect order, and then something happens. A biological conflict shock. Something happens that jeopardizes the fulfillment of our most primal needs. And then a biological program gets activated and this brings certain symptoms with it. And when this conflict is over, when we solved it or when it got redundant, then um, slowly the symptoms fade away and then we're back into normal again. That's an oversimplified version. We will dive into how the phases like play out for the different programs and we explore many examples. But it's very important to understand that disease, something that according to the five biological laws is, isn't a thing, <laughs> but what we call disease is nothing that hits us like out of a blue or like we get this disease because we were in close contact with other people or like whatever, no. Every symptom is the consequence of a special biological program that got activated because there was a conflict with our primal needs. So it's very important to learn to think primal. And the three criteria that need to be in place in order for a special biological program to get activated, the three criteria are first, highly acute. So something needs to happen that is like, woof, not like a small thing where like, oh yeah, hmm. But it's like, boom, it's a shock. It's a conflict shock. Second thing, it needs to be surprising. If we already know what is happening, then it's not a shock. Highly acute, surprising, and isolated. We need to feel alone with it. If we feel well supported um, to handle whatever happened, then this will quite likely not result in a special biological program. Only if it's highly acute, surprising, and we feel isolated, then our body is in emergency mode and it's like, okay, we need to start. We need to start something in order to um, enhance the chances that we, that we can solve this, that we can solve this problem. For example, let's dive into an example um, that illustrates this very nicely. For example, I'm still this very primal being. I'm walking through the African savanna with my tribe and we were trying to hunt a mammoth and then out of a sudden, my tribe abandons me. And they are like, okay, you are not a member of this tribe anymore. Leave. This, for our earliest ancestors, was a, probably the, the most intense conflict shock that, we, that they could suffer. 
because alone they were pretty helpless. So if I'm abandoned by my tribe, the three criteria, <laughs> highly acute, yes. Surprising, yes. Isolated, yes. And then what is the biggest danger um, if I'm alone in the African savanna? Of course, it's dying of thirst. With the blazing sun, I can only survive a couple of days without, without water. So the special biological program that gets activated in this, um, in this specific instance, when I'm feeling this kind of conflict shock, when I feel abandoned by my tribe, has to do with the kidney collecting tubules. I learned a lot of um, uh, English terms of parts of our body that I wasn't aware of before. In German, it's the Nierensammelrohre. It's a part of our kidneys. And the kidney collecting tubules, their task is to reabsorb water into the body. Out of the many, many, many liters of water that is circulating inside our bodies in the blood, only a small fraction gets um, gets peed out and the majority gets reabsorbed into the bloodstream and then circulated and circulated and circulated again. And when you feel abandoned, when you feel left alone, then the KCT, the kidney collecting tu tubules, keep more water inside your body. The percentage that they, that they say, okay, this can safely be peed out, decreases, which makes a lot of sense because if you store the majority of the water, if nothing gets, gets eliminated, your chances of surviving, even if you don't find water, increase. Makes a lot of sense. Makes a lot of sense to not let go of water when you think like, shit, I was abandoned. I don't know where to find water. So this is the conflict active phase. The kidney collecting tubules, they, they hold on to the water. And if the conflict is solved, if another tribe um, accepts you or if your tribe says like, hey, there was a bad day, there was a, like, let's not worry about it anymore, come join us any again. <laughs> um, in the conflict resolution phase that happens afterwards when we, when we feel relieved and we are like, oh, okay, this conflict finally has passed, then you pee all that excess water out. And the kidney collecting tubules, they're like, okay, I don't feel abandoned anymore, water can go out. So this feeling of being abandoned or like how it's described nicely in the five biological laws, feeling like a soul without a mother, just, just on your own. This conflict, is re it's, it's oftentimes, oftentimes called uh, the refugee conflict. It has to do with the kidney collecting tubules. Um, means that more water is stored inside the body. So, and since we are still these primal beings, but we probably don't live in the African savanna anymore, um, being excluded, being abandoned in today's world probably manifests like the 14-year-old teenager being excluded by his circle of friends. And they're like, oh no, we don't like you anymore. We play like with the other cool kids and you're left, left alone. This might trigger the exact same response. And this shows us that, that's what I mean with thinking primal, this shows us that our body tries to push every single conflict through our primal pathways. For our bodies, no such thing as a tax office that wants to have, get money from you <laughs> exists or being laid off at work or your car being stolen. All these things, like they don't exist for your primal bodies. And we try to push all these conflicts, all these things that happen in our lives, we try to push them through these primal avenues. So this certain type of conflict that our 14-year-old teenager might suffer by being excluded from a circle of friends might trigger the response that we already explored of the kidney collecting tubules they are holding on to more water. They are not um, letting it get eliminated and this means more water is stored inside the body during the conflict active phase and the longer the conflict active phase is maybe it's for weeks maybe it's for months maybe it's even for years that our 14 year old teenager feels um, abandoned he's storing more and more water 
and he's gaining a lot of weight. So, while most people think, oh, he's getting fat, that means he must eat all sorts of junk food and we need to put him on the diet, will probably not work because him gaining weight is just a result of him feeling abandoned and his kidney collecting tubules are in this conflict active phase, meaning they don't let the water go. And the solution to that might not be a diet, but the solution to that might be to support our little guy um, in not feeling abandoned anymore, in integrating him in, into the social circle or supporting him in finding new friends. When he doesn't feel abandoned anymore, the kidney collecting tubules go in the conflict resolution phase and that means they are letting all that water go. And he might lose weight without exercising and without going on a diet. Fascinating, huh? <laughs> so, this is very subjective. You cannot say, oh, your friends excluded you from, your, from, from their circle. That means now you have this KCT program, you have this abandonment conflict and you will gain weight now. No, it's very subjective. It, it always comes down to how does this thing that I'm experiencing, how does this feel to me? Does this feel like abandonment, like a soul without a mother? Then quite likely the KCT program is going to start. Maybe it feels different and then a different program is going to start. So it's always about how does this feel that um, determines which kind of program gets started. Into which of our primal avenues does my modern day conflict gets pushed through? And it's very important to understand that this biological conflict is it doesn't happen consciously, it happens on an instinctual level. This is not something we're like, oh okay. It's like bum, it's there. For example, if we if there's a banana skin and we are slipping on this banana skin, like our body is like, okay, it's not a problem, like we can just pick ourselves up and then continue to walk. But in the very moment that we're slipping on the banana on the banana skin, it's a it's an intense conflict. And this might be solved ten seconds afterwards which doesn't result in a, in a huge reaction inside our bodies. Yeah, but in the first place it gets, it gets triggered. So in response to this conflict shock, our body responds on three levels at the same time. First on the psyche level, by ruminating about the problem, about, by like this feeling of being abandoned of like okay what can i do and what like oh what did i say and why did they abandon me and and, 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 and so on like my psyche is um is occupied with um a lot of thoughts about the problem and this shows us that it's not like five biological laws is not the same thing as psychosomatic it's not about oh there's something going on in my psyche and this leads to a certain reaction inside my body. No, the psyche as well as the second, uh, the second uh, level, the organ, as well as the third level, the brain, which we'll explore in a second, they are all three pathways, all three responses to this, um, to this uh, conflict um, that we suffered, this conflict with our most primal biological needs. So the psyche is ruminating about the problem. The organ reacts, for example, in the way like the, the kidney collecting tubules by um, storing water. And on the brain, when you do a CT, you see a so-called Hamer's, Hamer's Hearth, and Hamer's Herd in German. Um, that's a, like a small black dot where you can see, ah, it's this part of the brain is related to this organ, um, which of course for us is um, as uh, as like normal people <laughs> is probably not very 
not very helpful because we don't have a CT device um, in our living rooms, but with the two other levels of our psyche and our organ, we can um, do a lot of Sherlock work and figure out what is going on as well. Because all these, like these three levels, the brain, the organ, um, and the psyche, they are all like walking hand in hand. Um, they are all a result of the conflict shock that we suffered from. So we can start on the psyche level or we can start on the organ level and then go into our uh, detective mode and try to figure out what is, what, is, what is happening there. It's very important to not be afraid of conflicts. Um, and it's even, it's even better to not call them conflicts, it's better to call them biological activations because this is what they are truly are. Something is going on inside our lives that um, that uh, triggers a biological activation um, with the intention to um, raise our chances of of surviving and thriving. Yeah, some some people within the five biological uh, laws uh, world they say we probably have ten to twenty active conflicts at each moment in our lives. All our point of views and our character are just the sum of all our running active conflicts, the sum of our, all our survival strategies. And for me, this realization was, uh, was the moment where I went even more all in into this topic because I was like, okay, what if everything that I believe to be me It's not really me. It's not really my character. It's just a limitation out of something that's running inside my body probably for years that I haven't let go of. What if a completely different life would be possible just by slowly diving into all my conflicts and facilitating their resolution? So yeah, I sense that the five biological laws is not only a topic that gets relevant when we have a running nose or when we have a swollen foot, but that is something that has an impact on like, everything in our lives. I really feel like it's that fundamental. And I'm slowly, slowly uncovering all that. And with this session, I want to inspire you to be like, what took place for me as well, of like, oh, wow, the rabbit hole goes deep goes deep okay let me let me go in there let me explore let me learn yeah let me experiment all right what's the procedure when something is going on the first thing is always to really accurately describe what is the symptom when did it start what is really taking place and not What is taking place in the current medical paradigm of like these bucket diagnoses? Oh, okay, you have a running nose and your head is hurting. Okay, you must have a flu. No, really describe accurately what is going on inside your throat, what is going on inside your head. And with that, I want to invite you to a little exercise, something that uh, I did in the past and that I'm... Um, <laughs> expanding on more and more and more. <laughs> Make a list of all the symptoms you currently have or had in the past. You can go all the way back to childhood or stay in the um yeah in the in the more recent past. What are all the symptoms you have? When something is hurting, something is not working the way you sense it should be working when you broke a leg, when like everything. What kind of symptoms are currently present or were present in the past? Please take a couple of minutes, maybe many more minutes. We can dive into that for hours and hours and hours. What kind of symptoms are there or were there? And when did they start? And if we already get certain ideas of, oh, maybe this was triggered by that. This happened directly after, like in Dr. Hammer's story, my son died and then I developed this testicular cancer. If there are some assumptions like this, feel free to write them down. Um, but for now, it's just about becoming aware of all the symptoms that are there. So pause this session and dive into that. Let's go.
All right, let's continue. The next question is, what is the exact, what is the exact tissue? Like, for example, my foot. I was like, okay, my left foot is swollen. And then I concretized that. Okay, where exactly? What kind of tissue? And then what is the special biological program behind this symptom? And how does this special biological program play out in the two phases? We're going to explore that in more depth um, later. This is the procedure that we're always going through when trying to make sense of anything that is going on inside our bodies or with um, friends, family members, and so on. Okay, we talked a lot about these five biological laws. What are they exactly? The first biological law, we already explored. It's that simple. The first biological law says each sensible biological special program is activated by a perceived developmentally dramatic cause. We are walking around in the African savanna. Our tribe abandons us and this necessitates the activation of a special biological program. This is what the first biological law is saying. This is how everything begins. And then the second biological program is about the law of the two phases of all special biological programs. The two phases are really, really, really important to understand in order not to not make wrong conclusions. In the beginning, everything is normal. We're just going through our lives, normal. Then the conflict shock takes place. After the conflict shock, we go immediately into the first phase, which is called the conflict active phase, CA phase. And our psyche, as we already explored, ruminates about the conflict. There's a certain sense of restlessness. Maybe there's a certain sense of fear. We probably have difficulty to sleep, to eat. Um, and the nature of our ruminating thought patterns may already point us towards the the biological program that is running. This is what happens on the psyche level. And on the organ level, there might in the conflict active phase, there might either be um, a tissue proliferation, so more tissue, as for example, um, to already spoiler that a little bit, we're going to dive into the case study of what is going on with my foot <laughs> in a second. Um, there's a tissue prol proliferation as it took place inside my foot. It was swollen in the conflict active phase. But uh, there might be as well a tissue loss, tissue minus in the conflict active phase. And there might be a function change, function plus or function minus. Both are possible. That's the conflict active phase. And then out of a sudden, our conflict gets solved because it's no longer no longer no longer there another tribe has um, accepted us our old tribe has said okay let's give you another chance our circle of friends integrated us again we found new friends we realized we don't need any friends because we have a beautiful family like whatever somehow the program is not um is not necessary anymore because this conflict just got solved. And this is the moment when we enter into the second phase. It's called the conflict resolution phase, PCL, post conflict to lose. Um, and for the conflict resolution phase, there are two parts PCLA, PCLA, and PCLB. Conflict resolution phase A and conflict resolution phase B. Very important to understand is that we technically cannot, cannot. Um, solve our own conflicts just by ourselves like the conflict resolution oftentimes, oftentimes takes place as unexpected as the conflict itself it's almost not, not possible to be to like <laughs> a, a, a very very um, normal reaction when diving into the five biological laws is like okay let me just figure out which conflicts are present inside my body right now and then i solve them one at a time bam 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 and then i'm free of those conflicts and i can finally thrive fully 
oftentimes we can solve our conflicts like in a conscious effort. Like when I, when I got abandoned by my tribe, I cannot think my way out of it. I cannot be like, okay, I don't need people. Like if I sense I feel abandoned, then I feel abandoned. And this gets, can, can only be solved by not feeling abandoned anymore. And of course, maybe we can facilitate our process of not feeling abandoned anymore. Um, but most of the time, this like hits us as unexpected as the conflict shock in the first place hit us. The PCLA, the first part of the conflict resolution phase, takes half as long as the conflict active phase, but maximum three weeks. Or to be like very accurate, um, it's about the. It's not only about the duration; it's about the integral. So that means if you see the, if you see the, um, the diagram of the of the two phases, like the the conflict active phase, um, above the curve, is always the same um, the same amount of conflict mass as it is below the curve in the PCLA and then the PCLB. This always needs to be the same. Very important is that the conflict resolution phase is not a healing phase. Many people conf still like with one leg in the old medical paradigm of like there's a disease and then there's a healing from this disease. No, it's not a healing phase. The five biological laws don't have anything to do with diseases and with healing because there, if there, if you cannot get sick, you don't need to heal. It's just conflict active phase and a conflict resolution phase, and you are perfect and whole the whole time. Most symptoms that we perceive physically, they are taking place in the conflict resolution phase, in the PCL phase, and on the organ level again there might be a tissue proliferation, tissue plus, or there might be a tissue loss, tissue minus. And as well, there might be a function plus or a function minus. Um, how to differentiate the two like, and to understand for which organ, in which phase, a function plus or a function minus is taking place. Um, we need to dive into the germ layers, which we'll do uh, soon. This is a little... Um, um, excourse into the third biological law, but let's stay where we are right now. After the PCLA, after the first part of the conflict active phase, um, there is the epicrisis. The epicrisis is this little blue peak that we see here, just like very short in duration between seconds and max four hours. And it's... Uh, we basically live through the conflict active phase um, in a time lapse, like really, really condensed. We perceive the conflict in a very short period of time, like and a lot more intense, both on the psyche level as well as physically on the organ level. So the symptoms of the conflict active phase, they come back a lot, a lot more intense for a very short period of time. And during the epicrisis, um, liquids get Extra, ex, excreted from from the organ like the organ like a sponge really like gets pushed together so that the liquid is coming out um, which is very important for uh, the swelling to um, to go away and after that there's a second part of the conflict resolution phase the PCLB and the duration is as long as the time that was left by the PCLA PCLA and on the organ level, again, there might be a tissue proliferation or a tissue loss and a function plus or a function minus. And the PCLB then in the end slowly goes, um, goes over into the normal state. Swellings go back through the excretion of liquids and mostly accompanied by feelings of salvation of like, ah, oh, ah, oh, finally I can breathe again. Conflict is over. Oh, it feels nice. And of PCLB always feels very nice. And then after that, back to normal again. And every symptom that we perceive in our body can either be categorized into one of those phases. It's either a conflict active phase symptom, it's a PCLA symptom, it's an epicrise symptom, or it's a PCLB symptom. 
Let's dive into um, some examples. Let's begin with our with our nose. And imagine, which is something that is very present over the course of my life, we experience nasal con congestion or we experience a running nose. So what might be going on there? Let's try to explore that. Um, this is a program of our nasal mucosa, Nasenschleimhaut in German. The nasal mucosa is there to sniff out danger. Again, we are primal beings. Maybe it helps to not imagine ourselves as a human, but maybe as a wolf. We are sniffing over the, over the earth, over the soil, in order to sense whether there is some danger going on, whether there is some enemy. So the nasal mucosa can either suffer like one of two conflicts. It can either be a scent conflict, where we are trying to to send whether there is danger in the air. If there is an enemy, I cannot see right now. Or it can suffer a stink conflict when something is very gross or unpleasant. The nasal mucosa has has the task to pr like protect us from enemies because we can we can sniff them. Um, and at the same time, it has the task to protect us from eating something that's for, that's probably rotten, rotten meat, rotten fruits. We don't want to eat them. And we smell and like, whoa, it's gross. Ooh. Okay, I cannot eat that. This is the task um, it has in our primal beings. So the conflict active phase of the nasal mucosa is a lowered sensitivity, which is there so that we can, imagine we are the wolf, sniffing on the earth, with the lowered sensitivity, we can sniff for a longer time and more intensely because if the normal sensitivity would be there, we could we would get all sorts of like sand and little stones inside our nose, and it's like we need to sneeze and ah, we cannot sniff. So the lowered sensitivity um, increases our capability to to really sniff whether there is danger. All the particles that would be coming in would irritate us if the normal sensitivity would be there and in in nature like all the programs would only ro run for a short period of time like the wolf doesn't need to sniff for like hours it's it's a question of minutes and then after that it's back to normal again but for us humans these programs they can they can run days or weeks or months or maybe even years and this is what is problematic because for the wolf, it's like, okay, a couple of minutes, sniffing, heightened sensitivity, conflict is over because we sensed there is no enemy or we sensed there's an enemy, but it's gone. Or we sense there's an enemy, enemy and it's here and then we go into fight mode. But then, of course, our program of the nasal mucosa is over because, yeah, we figured out what's going on and then probably another program is started so that we are prepared for the fight with our enemy. Um but for us humans, these programs, as I said, they can run like for a long, 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 long time. And if our conflict gets, gets solved, our nasal mucosa is swollen, our nose is blocked. Maybe that's what's going on when I'm in an airplane. I, I, didn't, figure out, I didn't figure it out fully, but um, in the conflict resolution phase, in the first part, the nasal mucosa is swollen, the nose is blocked, and then the epicrisis comes, and then the epicrisis, again, the symptoms of the conflict active phase, they are experienced again, but much more intensely. So this numbness, this uh, lowered sensitivity in the epicrisis is like really intense, it's really numb, and the um, um, after that, when it um, when we go into PCLB, the second far, the second phase of the conflict resolution phase, um, there is an oversensitivity, and this stark contrast between this intense numbness and then this oversensitivity um, leads to us sneezing. There is mucus coming out. We have a running nose, and then after that, back to normal. This is how the special biological program of the nasal mucosa is. Um, as playing out in order to support us to send whether there is danger or to prevent us from eating something that is that is rotten that is not good anymore um, and with with every every little case study with every 
um, sensible bio biological program that I'm exploring and that I'm understanding. I, as I said, like my appreciation for this infinite wisdom our bodies have, like, is like, oh, oh wow, wow, wow. Okay, let's turn to my foot. I figured out that um, the symptom of first being swollen and then after that a lot of pus was coming out, this yellow, yellowish liquid that's coming out of a wound, this can only be um, a result of a special biological program in the dermis. The dermis is the second uh, layer of our skin, three layers. The upper layer um, is the epidermis, Oberhaut, that we see here. And then the second layer, the dermis. And the dermis is, uh, is a very, very thick uh, skin and it's here to protect us. So if the biological purpose is to protect us, the kind of conflicts that we can suffer in the dermis are attack conflicts. When we sense that somebody wants to attack us, somebody is approaching us with a spear and they want to like hit us in our chest, of course, it just makes sense for our dermis to grow thicker, to be swollen in order to be able to protect us better from this attack. It can be an attack conflict or it can be a, a feeling of being soiled, being dirty. Like, for example, if we step into, a, into the poop of a dog or into a snail or something that's like, ooh, gross. Uh, or the dermis reacts in the same way. It grows thicker in order to be uh, able to protect us better against, against this um, intruder. So the conflict active phase, the dermis is building up tissue in order to grow thicker, in order to be um, a better protection. And when we sense that this conflict has passed, then, of course, this tissue needs to be, um, needs to go slowly back to normal and this is taking place by in the conflict resolution phase pus flowing out and the swelling decreases and this is what I'm in right now I'm obviously in the conflict resolution phase foot is um, slowly getting back to normal a lot of stuff from inside the foot is flowing out yes and maybe now you ask yourself the question why are some tissues swollen in the conflict active phase? And why are some tissues swollen in the conflict resolution phase, in the PCL? For example, the foot is swollen in the PCL. Uh, the foot is swollen in the conflict active phase. And the nasal mucosa, our previous example, swollen in the conflict resolution phase, in the PCL. And this brings us to the third biological law. The third biological law explains how the various tissues inside our body behave in the phases. And this brings us to the, I already dropped this term, to the four different germ layers. Based on how our bodies were built through this long process of evolution, they are more more primal, more, more old, more like um, parts of our body that were developed um, before and then there are parts of our body that were developed afterwards and this categorizes every tissue inside our body in these four germ layers. The, the oldest, the most primal uh, germ layer is the endoderm and the endoderm is here for our most primal functions to um, to get energy to to basically to be able to be alive our most vital substances that we need to get um, they are all um, um, in the endoderm that means the conflicts that we have there they are called chunk conflicts there are certain chunks that we need to get we need to get food we need to get air we need to get something to just be able to survive. So organs that are at home in the endoderm are, for example, the pancreas, Bauchspeicheldrüse in German, our intestines, the liver, or the KCT, the kidney collecting tubules that we explored in our abandonment conflict that uh, store water. 
like all these, they are at home in the endoderm. Um, and then after that, the second germ layer that um, that resulted in the process of, of evolution is called the, the mesoderm. The mesoderm is um, split into two parts. There's the old mesoderm and there's the new mesoderm. Let's begin with the old mesoderm. The old mesoderm, like around the most basic vital functions of our body, around that um, is, a, is a layer that... Um, is here for protection. So all the tissues in the old mesoderm are to protect us. So for example, the dermis, the second layer of our skin, Lederhaut in German, this is part of the old mesoderm. At the same time, the uh, pericardium, Herzbeutel, and the peritoneum, Bauchfell, our sweat glands, like all the parts of our system that are here to protect, protect our heart, protect our intestines, protect uh, like uh, by prote the dermis, the skin that is protecting us. All these are part of the old mesoderm. And the endoderm and the old mesoderm, the two germ layers that we just explored, the two most inner, so to say, they are in the conflict active phase, experiencing a function plus and a tissue plus. So tissue gets built up and the function gets increased. And then in the conflict resolution phase, in the PCL, there's a tissue minus and a function normalization. So tissue slowly, as it's, as it's taking place inside my foot, conflict active phase, tissue build up. The dermis, like... Is growing bigger, it's swollen, and there's a function plus so that it can better protect me against this um, attack or this feeling of being soiled. And then in the conflict resolution phase, the tissue slowly gets, um, gets, um, gets back to normal, tissue minus, and then the function normalizes as well. So this is true for these two germ layers, for every tissue inside our body that is either part of the endoderm or of the old mesoderm. Contrary to that, the other two layers, the new mesoderm and the ectoderm, they are behaving exactly in the opposite way. The new mesoderm, all the, all the, all the parts of our body that are part of the new mesoderm, they are for stability, for strength, for power. It just makes sense, like the, the most inner part, the endoderm, it's just to, to get our most basic chunks that we need, like digestion and so on. And around that, there's a layer for, for, um, for protection. And then around that, there's a layer for stability, for power, for force. Um, and part of the new mesoderm are things like our skeleton, all our bones, our muscles, our tendons, zenon, new word that I learned, and the connective tissue, Bindegewebe, as well. All these parts of our body, they are, um, they are um, part of the new mesoderm. And then the, the most outer layer, the newest of the germ layers, it's called ectoderm. And the ectoderm is, uh, there are many things that are part of the ectoderm. For example, ectoderm is... Uh, is here for perception, for our contact with the outside world, for seeing, for hearing, smelling. Um, our communication is rooted there. Territorial things, our sexuality, all that is part of the ectoderm, the most, uh, the most outer layer. And what kind of tissues are part of that? For example, the epidermis, the most outer layer of the skin, our hair, our nerves, all our senses, smell, hear, taste, um, this is all contributed um, to the ectoderm. And as I said, the two last germ layers that we explored, the new mesoderm and the ectoderm, in the conflict active phase, there's a function minus and a tissue minus. Well, in the conflict resolution phase, in the PCL, there is a tissue plus and the restoration of the, of the function that was previously decreased. So this is very important to learn 
to which of the four germ layers each tissue inside our body that is currently expressing a symptom is um, is part of and then to check in how does this tissue in this germ layer react in the conflict active and in the conflict resolution phase. So this is like the the most basic toolkit for everybody um, studying the five biological laws. First, exploring um, like where is this symptom taking place? In which which tissue is is affected? And it's a lot more complex than just my eyes. There are so many different tissues inside our eyes. Same is true. It's not just my foot. Like which layer of the skin is uh, is reacting right now? And then this layer of skin, the dermis, which for which of the four germ layers um, is that in? Oh, okay. It's an old mesoderm. Um, um, tissue that means in the conflict active phase there's a function and the tissue plus means it's swollen in the conflict active phase. So that means if I see the dermis being swollen, I already know oh conflict active phase. If I see it's not swollen and it's more like wet and there is pus coming out, I know ah conflict resolution phase. So this is this is what I mean with the with the Sherlock Holmes um um approach yeah and this answers the question why my foot is swollen in the conflict active phase because the dermis is part of the old mesoderm and why the nasal mucosa is um that's part of the ectoderm why that is uh swollen in the conflict resolution phase because ectodermal um tissues are um are expressing a tissue plus in the conflict resolution phase while old mesodermal structures um, express a tissue plus in the conflict active phase all right that was a an introduction into the world of the five biological laws We explored the first three biological laws. First biological law, the necessity for a special biological program um, that is caused by this biological activation, by a conflict with our most primal biological needs. And then the second biological law, the law of the phases, conflict active phase, conflict resolution phase, PCLA, then the epic crisis, and then the conflict resolution phase B and we explored the third biological law um, the four germ layers the endoderm, the old mesoderm the new mesoderm and the ectoderm and this is just scratching on the surface <laughs> I've been studying this topic on and off for many many months now and I'm still like just at the tip of the iceberg it's quite a rabbit hole. Um, and I'd like to re invite you, before we close, I'd like to invite you to pause here and to review all your notes that you took over the session. Everything that you wrote down. If you didn't write anything down, just close your eyes and take a couple of moments to contemplate what just happened. Let it circle through your system again what was especially noteworthy, what was especially like, oh, wow, oh, wow, this was something new. Pause here and take a moment to, to reflect on that. All right, then. I'd like to close with a quote by Dr. Hammer, and he said, after learning all that, I'm not afraid of death anymore because if everything is so perfect on this side, I can only imagine it to be the same on the other. And this perfectly encapsulated, encapsulates what the studies of the five biological laws gift me with. An incredible appreciation for the infinite wisdom of my body, for the infinite wisdom of life itself, the four, five biological laws, that are, they are not only at work inside our 
species inside of Homo sapiens bodies, but they are governing all of life. Yeah. And by understanding that there's no wrongness, that there's no enemy, that there's nothing we need to fight against, that there is no evil disease, that there are, there are no contagious viruses that we need to protect ourselves against, that everything, every symptom our bodies express is just birthed out of the necessity for us to raise our chances of thriving and surviving. Everything is for us. Which doesn't mean that there is no such thing as a danger caused out of a symptom. If, for example, a conflict was active for like months or maybe even years, of course, stepping into conflict resolution phase with maybe a swelling might be very dangerous. There are people who are dying in this process. For example, by a heart attack. But a heart attack is not something that hits us out of the blue. A heart attack might be uh, the super intense epic crisis after a conflict that was active for three years. And we die from that. That's absolutely possible. Which means that in certain instances, it might be very important to go really slow or to um, use traditional medicine, use something as a painkiller, as I did um, while navigating my process with the foot. There were three moments where it was so intense, the pain was so intense, the most intense physical pain I experienced so far. It was so, so, so intense. And I took a painkiller and that was really nice. So the five biological laws are not saying like traditional medicine is bad. Um, but it puts many things into perspective. And for me personally, I understood what is really going on and how to use traditional medicine in order to aid our natural processes of our bodies and not to take it as the one size fits all like the we started with how important it is to learn to think systemically. Um, and traditional medicine is often this like linear, short-sighted, oh, you have a certain symptom, throw this pill, or we need to do this kind of surgery and remove it. This is what the doctor said when, it, when he looked at my foot. Oh, okay, uh, we need to cut your foot open, we need to remove all the pus, otherwise it will infect more and more and more, and it will spread through your whole foot and up your leg, and you will need to go through a very... <laughs> Very intense, very, very painful kind of surgery. Better to remove it now and then you take antibiotics and you need anti-inflammatory and everything will go back into order. No. That's, an, that's not an appropriate reaction to what is going on inside my body. Appropriate reaction is to understand our oh, conflict active phase, our oh, swollen, our oh, conflict resolution phase, pus coming out, swelling going back to normal. And I can aid this process by a painkiller if I need it. But besides that, I let my body just do its thing and unfold its magic. Yeah. So, if this sparked any interest in you, I would like to invite you to make a commitment to learn and make a commitment to accuracy. This is something that I take away from my studies of the five biological laws. Accuracy is so important. You cannot say, oh, my foot is swollen. You need to figure out which part which tissue is swollen and how does this tissue behave in the phases in order not to be like, oh, swollen foot, okay, this program. No, 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 no. This is old thinking. New thinking is like, what is really going on? And in which phase is it? And when did it start? And of course, <laughs> most of the time, many, many programs are active at the same time. So it's really like, it really takes a lot of mental energy it takes a lot of like deepening of our skill to think systemically and at the same time the deeper we dive into it the more we get a sense we get a feeling like we learn to think primal we get a sense of ah what might be going on there um but of course this takes time this takes practice thank you for embarking on the on this exploration of this hugely important topic with me today it was a lot of fun and at the same time I sense this can only be the beginning. <laughs> Thank you. All right. I can only try to guess what might be alive inside yourself right now. <laughs> mm. 
Mamagaya is strong. It's starting to rain soon. Yeah. <laughs> if you feel a calling to work on this hugely important topic of the five biological laws, if you want to implement that, if you want to study that further, and if you want to walk this path alongside other practitioners who are going for a deepening of their own embodiment of what they want to see in the world in order to be able to serve more in their families, in their communities, in their businesses, and ultimately to the whole of Gaia, then I'd like to invite you to our Custodia Lab. You can apply, we have the link down below, and then we're going to hop on a call. It's a powerful, really, really powerful squad of future custodians that are walking this path, and it's, an, it's a joy and an honor to be able to guide that. Yes. <laughs> See you in the future, be it in our custodial lab or here in Bali or anywhere else in the world. It was a lot of fun to unpack this topic together today. Looking forward to hear from you. If you want to share something that emerged for you, put it here in the, in the YouTube comments or send me a DM on Instagram or yeah, let me know. A lot is stirred up inside myself right now and if it was the same for you, then I see this as a success. <laughs> see you. Bye-bye.